old. So this is means that um, if that young talent is not invested in, mentored and developed and coached, there's going to be a very huge potential run and huge potential loss if they're left behind. Uh, today, uh, we have a very rich panelist uh, that we are going to kind of uh, brainstorm and uh, unpack some of the uh, lessons learned and also get insights from the Kenya Innovation Outlook and uh, the Africa Innovation Outlook, while at the same time, unpacking some of the uh, lessons learned from the AU-EU Innovation Agenda. As part of the panelists, uh, we have uh, Mr. Lukovi Seke. Mr. Lukovi Seke is a 15 year uh, old expertise in strengthening capacities in almost 43 African Union member states to measure science, technology and innovation in leading the current phase of the 2021-2025 Africa Science, Technology and Innovation Indicators Program. We have Masi Kimalat. Uh, Masi Kimalat is the CEO of uh, ASEC uh, since 20, uh, 2021. Uh, she has eight years experience in designing and managing impact driven programs across diverse sectors in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Ridley, uh, who is a multifaceted uh, career. Uh, which spans from academia, industry, and public, international public and uh, relation and diplomacy. His academic expertise covers malaria drug, uh, vaccine research, public health, private public partnerships and innovation. He has authored over 100 scientific publications and has generated several patents. Um, we have uh, Mr. Dr. Amos Chege. Uh, who is the coordinator of innovation and entrepreneurship in the Directorate of Research, Development and Extension. He's a lecturer in the Department of Computer Science, School of Computing, Informatics and at Meru University and Science and Technology in Kenya. Uh, so to set us off, I'll welcome uh, Dr. Robert Ridley uh, from uh, Malawi for a keynote speech. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. I'll speak for about maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Is that is that about is that is that the length of time you want me to speak for? For 20 minutes. 20. Chai TV is 20, okay. Yes. No. Can you see the screen? Very well. Okay, so I'll try to uh, take it through to for 20 minutes. Um, topic is translating research into impact for the poor through locally led innovations in Africa. And my focus in this has been more on the innovation entrepreneurship side than on the research side. So I'll be, first of all, giving a bit of background just to show how innovation can link to a just transition for Africa and impact on economic growth. I'll then give some examples of innovation entrepreneurship uh, from Malawi and a few from outside Malawi. Uh, when you're talking about innovation entrepreneurship in Africa, you tend to be talking about low tech and medium tech, and we still need to move to the high tech. We also are talking about small and medium enterprises, and we have a few examples of growth into large enterprises. And I'll finish off by talking about maybe the value of research for scaling up innovations so we can have a an economy of scale that uh, can benefit uh, the society as a whole. So if we're talking about a just transition for Africa, which is the title of the day's events, we require equitable socioeconomic development, equitable growth, uh, that requires enhanced equitable access to education, including higher education and postgraduate education. Uh, requires innovation entrepreneurship, and there's an, a strong emphasis on social entrepreneurship, 
uh, even where uh, we are dealing with for-profit companies. And at the end, uh, we need more research and innovation capacity in the continent uh, to apply that, uh, uh, to, to, to apply research and innovation locally. This is, uh, we hear that innovation correlates with development and GDP. This was the paper that demonstrated that. Uh, an index for innovation was developed and it was mapped over uh, activities of countries for two years. And you see a very straight line of correlation. So where you have uh, high levels of education associated with high levels of innovation, you get that correlation with the growth. And that's, if you like, the fundamental rationale that you give to uh, politicians and developing agencies about the power of research, the power of innovation. Um, evidence also shows that uh, for economies to catch up and develop, uh, it requires going through a process of industrialization and then moving and developing to what are called the frontier new technologies. The majority of African countries are in this catch up phase at the moment. And we are looking to try and work with systems and develop systems that can move our countries um, along that trajectory. And probably the African, the Continental Free Trade Agreement will be one of the major vehicles for that. Um, Africa has a lot of indigenous innovative capacity, just as any community anywhere in the world has that capacity. It's just uh, having the opportunity to develop that capacity. So you're probably aware of uh, this story about um, uh, the boy who harnessed the wind, uh, a Malawian young boy student um, who uh, was in a setting where there was no electricity. He, he uh, had a school book called Using Energy. In that book, there was a picture of a windmill. And so he built a windmill and created a generating system out of that. It lit his home and also in the second iteration, actually developed a water pump to um, uh, irrigate the fields of the village and uh, keep, the, keep the village in, um, in food secure. So uh, he's now famous. He's on many talk shows in the US. He has a book, but it all started with a student reading a book and having the desire to create something to innovate. And that's inherent in all our communities. Um, I do some work with a group called the Flame Tree Initiative. Uh, we have what we call development entrepreneurship labs where we bring entrepreneurs together. And the finding from this work of this organization is that you don't really have to do too much by way of training. If you bring the right people together, they can create a network and they teach and train themselves. So we create this network of entrepreneurs and uh, we follow it up with some uh, specific mentoring, assistance with uh, developing plans of action. But it, has a, it generates a life of its own and the, uh, the people involved um, uh, utilize uh, the networks and, and they, it's, it's a self-sustaining approach that we find works very well. Um, just some examples of the entrepreneurs that are being supported through this uh, network. We have a uh, Wazi Njaku who has uh, set up a waste management uh, supply chain uh, waste management uh, company, converting waste into briquettes and organic manure. And she's uh, servicing her community, a lot of women. Uh, gaining an, an income and employment through this uh, activity. 
we have um, uh, another entrepreneur who's uh, working through education, providing farmers with the necessary implements and also providing them with access to markets. We have another organization called Smart Energy Enterprise, which is uh, using solar power to irrigate um, at 200 hectares with small smallholder farmers and uh, uh, generating uh, rice in Karonga in the north of Malawi. And another example, moving, if you like, a little bit more high tech, uh, this is uh, a young man who's set up an online uh, uh, medical consultancy, so remote consultations, remote monitoring, uh, and providing home-based uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation services. So using technology to deliver health care. And those are very small efforts, uh, getting slightly larger. Uh, this is Victoria Mwakulira, who's uh, won several awards. She's set up an agro-processing uh, organization that services 1,500 smallholder farmers. And um, from that activity, uh, there are spin-off companies and also spin-off cooperatives developing. So it's a self-sustaining company, and it's generating new companies, new cooperatives, as, as, as the as the parent company grows. We have, and the examples I've uh, mentioned are prevalent in all countries at a low scale. And we are uh, on this network now, we have people who are managing hubs. So I now just want to talk a little bit about uh, tech hubs. Um, again, an example of one here in Malawi, Zuka that has uh, three business hubs uh, situated in different parts of uh, one of our cities, Blantyre. Uh, it's generated 147 business entities and, and, and growing, and also training large numbers of people. Uh, the biggest technology hub in Malawi is M-Hub. Uh, that creates a working space for innovators, entrepreneurs. It's generated over a million dollars in financing, uh, calculates that it's created over 950 jobs, and the throughput of people being trained in, in tech, particularly computer skills, IPT skills, now as numbers over 40,000. So we are in an environment where we have these small scale enterprises operating. We have a growing number of technology hubs that are stimulating them and encouraging them to grow and develop. And this is where the heart of, if you like, uh, Africa's growth is likely to emerge. From these efforts, from these activities, we're likely to see some uh, innovations take off and really grow and create uh, uh, wealth uh, within the countries. Uh, this is uh, from Aquilabs, and you can see the spread of uh, innovation hubs that are developing across the continent. In some areas, you have more activity than others. And when we talk about equitable development for Africa, I think we also need to be thinking about equitable development between countries as well as within countries. Um, there's going to be, uh, we have a, a danger of having a, a, a wide income uh, distribution within countries and also across countries if we don't manage things appropriately. Just some other examples from outside Malawi of uh, technologies that are taking off. Um, we have uh, scratch cards to check that medicines are not fake. Uh, there's a, an effort to use smartphones to connect with patients for eye care. And I think uh, many people have heard about the Reedy uh, um, company that are using drones for de medicine delivery in, in Rwanda. Uh, interestingly, that company started off by developing and delivering uh, medicines 
and um, uh, critical equipment in Rwanda, uh, but it had a swift element to the ownership. And that company has now expanded into using drones for delivery of services in Switzerland as well. So you have a case of a, an innovation starting in Africa and moving to Europe. And there are many examples of uh, innovation, many growing examples of in entrepreneurship. Uh, recently, there was the um, uh, 22 award ceremony for African tech, 18 winners across a whole range of different uh, sectors uh, from health, fintech, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so we have a, a system developing through which innovation can occur. I think the challenge for a lot of the innovation that is taking place, a lot of the entrepreneurs that are seeking to develop, and I suppose also for the hubs that are supporting them, is to identify, is to allow um, innovations to be identified for scaling up. Um, we have lots of good ideas, but if you have a good idea around agriculture, uh, that has more benefit if it can be done at scale. Um, similarly with health delivery and health services, uh, they need to be delivered at scale. Uh, IT services need to be delivered at scale. So we need better commercial and local financing systems to move these projects to scale. So as we're talking about research, innovation, entrepreneurship, we need to be connecting with financial systems that can support the innovation. And I think it's fair to say that at the moment, most of the money coming in to support the type of innovation, the type of entrepreneurship that I mentioned is external. And we need to work hard, harder so that the African banks are providing uh, loans and access to finance. Uh, and we are stimulating our financial technology sector. Uh, in that regard, um, there's a company called FutureLink Technology in Uganda, which recently won a global award for product innovation of the year. And they work through a network of credit unions, microfinance institutions, and through this network, they can maximize the amount of money that they have for, um, uh, for supporting innovation and at the same time promoting uh, community savings. Uh, the networking process, the online approach, means that it's operating at about 10% of what the traditional cost of this activity would be. So here we have a connection between technical innovation and, and financial support. Now, as we move to scale up innovation, it moves to be a more complex process. Um, uh, small scale innovation can happen in a community um, with a few people, with a small partnership. As soon as you're looking to scale up that innovation, you have to involve uh, many different sectors, many different skill sets, and you have an iterative process of uh, discovery and improvement. But at the end, that innovation will lead to hopefully a social business or entrepreneurship. And uh, collectively, it can also lead to national socioeconomic development. Again, as you're scaling up innovation, that requires more finance, and it carries more risk. So again, as entrepreneurs are moving, if you like, from the uh, small scale entrepreneur, from the small enterprise to the medium enterprise, if they then want to go to the large enterprise, then they have to find investors that are willing to carry risk because something that works on a small scale may not work on a large scale. And um, product developers, for this phase of development, the value of debt, because you find 
uh, a number of activities that can survive at a small level, um, you'll find only a small percentage of those will be able to deliver at a large scale. So identifying those and supporting them is a risky business, um, which is why uh, investor loans tend to be uh, so expensive. So I want now just to give us uh, two examples of how research has enabled um, concept ideas uh, to be scaled up. Uh, the first is an outcome of a PhD uh, project that was done at one of the universities in Malawi, uh, in collaboration with some uh, UK partners. And it relates to a small island in Lake Malawi called Yukoma Island. So this island is isolated. Um, it was dependent on diesel generation for, um, for its energy and the level of coverage on the island for electricity was very, very low because of that. Um, the PhD project involved a feasibility study of solar power and wind power and a very detailed analysis of what was required and what the cost would be for establishing and setting up um, solar power units or and or wind power units on the island. And the, um, the study was of a quality that it led to the uh, local uh, energy company, uh, Agenco, actually investing in establishing solar power plants on the island. And the island is now largely self-sufficient for energy production. So that's a case where um, uh, analytical research, uh, a knowledge of uh, the technologies can lead to enhanced investment and massive improvements to the, to the local community. Um, the second example I want to give of research enhancing uh, benefits for the community and scaling up is in the area of community health. And this relates back to some work that I was involved with back in, in with WHO. So some of you may be aware of a disease called river blindness, which uh, affects uh, Western Central Africa. It's transmitted by black fly, a small worm gets inside the, uh, in, inside the, inside the uh, patient and the worm produces small worms which travel to the eye and the immune reaction to those small micro worms uh, generates blindness. So you have in certain parts of Africa, it's in the process of elimination that you have this disease. And the way that it was uh, tackled in the 80s and 90s was through the delivery of a drug called ivermectin. So these communities were uh, scattered, they were dispersed, and the drug could not be delivered in the traditional way. And so a process of community-directed intervention was developed where the responsibility for the delivery and the handling and the distribution of the, of the drug was left with trained people in the communities. Uh, the picture there just shows a, a man measuring uh, the height of a boy so that he can decide how much of the drug should be given to the boy as a preventive treatment for this disease. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, it was decided that we should see whether this approach also worked for other diseases such as malaria. Um, uh, also uh, vitamin A distribution and some other interventions, but particularly malaria. And a large multi-country study was, uh, was uh, developed uh, with, with a group that was called the CDI study group. So this was a uh, large uh, project covering many countries, covering many communities, involved um, uh, clinical investigators, health economists, statisticians, and social scientists. 
Um, the results of that large effort are just shown on this slide, but essentially, uh, contrary to what a lot of uh, the professionals, the health professionals were, were saying, um, the community directed interventions could be applied to malaria in particular. So the graph on the left shows how uh, if you uh, use the community directed intervention against the control, uh, against control communities over one year, you get a, a, an increase in the appropriate treatment of children with fever. And then after two years, it goes up to uh, I think 70%. So you've gone from 30% um, appropriate treatment of uh, children with fever to 70%. The other aspect of the study showed that this community directed approach was also lower cost than the traditional approach. And this led to WHO in the African region uh, making this into a policy. And that, so community directed interventions for um, multiple indications is now uh, accepted and promoted across many regions of Western Central Africa. Um, so we've covered the fact that there is a lot of activity on the ground in Africa, a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of ingenuity, a lot of um, a will, if you like, amongst communities to uh, innovate and self-help their communities and deliver also uh, companies and institution, institutions that are economically viable and successful. Many of those entrepreneurs that we see working in the fields or working with the solar panels um, are graduates. Uh, some of them are, uh, have masters or doctoral degrees. But almost invariably, you find that they're graduates who have the, um, the knowledge and then, if you like, the, the energy of youth to make something happen. So in the same way as we had the boy, uh, uh, the boy who utilized the wind for the, uh, for the windmill, um, he got that idea from reading a book. It was because he was a secondary school student that he was able to do that for his village. In the same way, I think a lot of the entrepreneurs that we're seeing in Africa today are coming from uh, as graduates. Um, in Africa, you have about 9% of people uh, entering university. In the uh, north and the developed world, that figure reaches 70%. In some parts of Africa, for example, Malawi, it's as low as 2%. And um, you then also, if you're really wanting to scale up, do the sort of research that lead to uh, really completely new innovations and products, or the talks, or the types of research that uh, I was talking to. Uh, about with respect to Likoma Island and the energy, uh, the justification for energy generation or the community directed interventions for health, you need postdoctoral students or postdoctorally or doctorally trained uh, individuals as well. And one of the best single um, uh, indicators of the level of innovation in a country is the number of researchers or the intensity of researchers in a given country. And that's illustrated on this graph here from UNESCO. And again, you see the disparity that exists between Africa and the rest of the world, but also within Africa. And so I suppose my final message is that we need to be encouraging a lot of the activity that we're engaging in. It's producing an ecosystem that will yield growth. And uh, before COVID, most African countries were growing at a faster rate than the developed countries. And 
if you like, Africa is in the process as a whole of, do, of catching up. But for it to really take hold, we need to have a strong investment in education and particularly Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I think we lost you in the last few seconds. Uh, all we can agree is that uh, innovation is central uh, to the largest challenges the world faces, especially in Africa, uh, in terms of climate change and uh, the aging society to global pandemics. Uh, we are thrilled to have AfriLabs uh, in the room. Uh, we have uh, Eddie Gitonga. Uh, from uh, Tibin, uh, who is going also to give us more insight uh, in terms of how the, their innovations is impacting the community that they are adjacent to. Uh, during the COVID season, of course, we saw communities step up to support each other in innovative ways using locally led solutions during the lockdown. And we want to continue to back them in the ways that we can rebuild and recover from COVID-19, even as we talk about adaptation and mitigation. Uh, so quickly, um, maybe in the next uh, discussion, uh, we'll of course unpack more of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the discussion you've just brought up uh, while unpacking insights from the Kenya Innovation Outlook and the Africa Innovation Outlook as well. Uh, quickly, I want to bring um, uh, Ms. Uh, Masi Kimalat, uh, who is the uh, CEO of uh, ASEC, to just kind of uh, discuss or uh, explain to us on how ASEC is fostering demand-driven innovations through research. And also, as we know, like locally innovation, locally led innovations have been critiqued to generating solutions which are more specific to the scope and limited to their reach uh, within the micro environment that they are in, and therefore pose a scale a challenge of addressing these challenges uh, of say poverty at a scale. So I'd also want to hear from her what she has to say in terms of coming up with enabling systems and conditions that are necessary ingredients for economic development at the local level and also at the global level for these locally led innovations. So um, welcome, Ms. Uh, Masi Kimalat. Uh, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, for this uh, brief. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Sorry, I'm at the Kenya Innovation Week, so there, there may be slightly a bit of uh, background noise. But let me know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, but there's some Wonderful. slight Great. background noise. No, I really want to give uh, credit to the previous presenter uh, for the research that they've actually been able to conduct. And I love how they've said that we definitely need, need more researchers to foster the growth of the innovation ecosystem. Um, if you're looking at what's happening now with the Kenyan ecosystem, we're really at, a, we're now entering into the growth phase uh, because now we have proper structures in place. We have a very vibrant um, government agency where innovation is actually being uh, held at, which is now the Kenyan National Innovation Agency. Um, that has become very vibrant in terms of owning the innovation ecosystem agenda. And even right now, they've been able to launch the Kenya Innovation Week, uh, which is now in the second edition aside last year. And so there's a lot of good milestones that have taken place. Um, and ASEC being a network association that's bringing together diverse members across the country who are actually serving entrepreneurs across the different sectors and even bringing those entrepreneurial services right to their community. So for example, like we have um, uh, one of our coaching organizations or a member that's actually providing um, investment readiness support for an entrepreneur that is actually based in Wajir, which is the northern part of Kenya and really helping them develop their business model, 
um, looking at how to support um, them get access to markets and then also linking them also to a community of entrepreneurs around that region, the Northern Kenyan region. And so for us really at a national level, uh, we understand that we, there's a lot that needs to be done. And we, of course, uh, we are able to convene um, different stakeholders, including development partners, the government agencies like Kenya National Innovation Agency, and even Konza Technopolis, which is a smart city. Um, smart, it's actually one of the smart cities within Kenya. Um, that's really creating um, a conducive environment in terms of creating co-working spaces and also having maker spaces where entrepreneurs can go and prototype and set up their labs. So we're really convening all these resources now down through our members to now the actual entrepreneurs who can access them. So a couple of uh, three things that I, I, I wanted to note down um, as the key ingredients really to foster an enabling environment, there are three of them. The first one is looking at policy and regulation. So as I said, we've been championing the startup bill since 2018. We've been looking at how do we, first of all, create a conducive environment to help these different um, startups not only create an innovation, but actually have the right environment for them to actually scale that innovation across, not only in Kenya, but also looking at Pan-African and international markets. And the one thing that we realized was that there's no recognition of a startup as how the Kenyan government saw these innovative, these innovative businesses, they call them SMEs. And the challenge with being lumped up as an SME is that you don't, actually don't receive the tailored support that you need. And then also the critical need for a startup is also early stage investment. And so with that, we've been able to draft um, the bill. So before the government um, changed hands this year, it was actually going to the floor of parliament for the past reading. But then with the change of new government, now we have to pick up that discussion again aggressively. Um, good news on this is that last, it's actually yesterday we had, we hosted the, the president at the Kenya Innovation Week and even made a pledge to actually support um, the SATA bill to become an act. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that if we, when we have this as an act, one, we have a legal framework that recognizes how startups are governed and also how we can create incentives, linking it up now with the Ministry of Trade, Industrialization, Cooperatives and SMEs, and actually begin creating incentives to actually help foster um, these different solutions to scale into um, the different parts of the country. So that's one thing that's ongoing. The second thing is that we, we have a project that's funded by um, GIZ, and it's actually on linking rural um, and grassroots innovations in Western Kenya, which is now focusing on agriculture um, and looking at it as a value chain approach on how we can support those um, marginalized women and youth into the agricultural value chain. Because once um, there was a study that was done last year, no, between 2020 and 2021, where they actually showcase that it's only 10% of women and youth that are part of agriculture. And so one of the things that we're trying to do right now is actually assess the policy barriers and also looking at the business environment on what is actually hindering more youth and more women to enter into agriculture. With that alignment, we can now go back into the different counties because Kenya has 47 counties and we can actually start pushing for policies at a local level. So right now we're working with Kisumu County, Bungoma, uh, Kakamega, Vihiga and Siaya counties. And we already established relationships with the different um, sector leads within the counties. And also we're beginning to have those conversations on how we can create a more conducive policy environment. And also looking at the regulation, because now an example is, for example, if someone wants to scale their business from one county to the other, they actually have to pay an entry fee to enter to the county. So we're also trying to demystify and also reduce those barriers to market um, for entrepreneurs to scale across the different counties. The good thing is that when the policies are right, then thriving for the ecosystem is actually a guarantee. The second one we're looking into is the investment pipeline. So how, uh, one thing that we did with uh, partnering with the UK government, which is the 
uh, Knowledge Transfer Network under the British High Commissioner, we actually designed a program where we're strengthening the investment pipeline. So looking at how do we create relationships with other UK investors and also development partners, and then now linking them directly to the actual Kenyan startups within the Kenyan ecosystem. The beautiful thing about this is that our members are also Pan-African, so they also have uh, offices that are running regionally. And for that, we're actually able to now begin speaking about the African continental free trade, whereas we are actually able to deploy capital into Kenya to now help these entrepreneurs scale also across Africa. And that's an interesting discussion that's happening. The second thing that also we're doing is developing an investment toolkit um, and it's actually ongoing that we're going to be able to just demystify the whole investment pipeline um, value chain and even providing relevant support to entrepreneurs across the business uh, growth stages. So, for example, if a business is really at ideation, then what the type of investor or, um, or impact investor or VC they'll be looking for will actually able to tailor that and actually showcase who exactly they need to be targeting. If it's at growth stage, then they like actually know exactly which type of investor they need to target and what are the requirements. This will actually help reduce the timeline uh, from you know, initiating a conversation with an investor and actually closing it. Because roughly right now from our data, it shows it takes around three years to actually close a deal, um, a substantive deal with a startup. So we're trying as much as we can to reduce that by giving information on time through those toolkits and then providing the mentorship and support through different investor readiness sessions and then now linking them directly with the, with the different investor networks and ecosystems. An example of this is also, uh, and I'm also happy to see AfriLabs is here. Af AfriLabs, we've partnered with them to run different uh, sessions. And I know that this year also we ran a session on investment uh, strengthening and that in a way also begins to bring the conversation at a more pan-african level not just only at a country focus but also at a pan-african level where we can begin muscling up enough or a bigger chunk of actually the investment resources that can actually help businesses that are in the specific value chain scale across africa as well the third one and the final one is looking at the data and knowledge economy Research, as you had rightly mentioned, is very critical. Um, giving, looking at back at how we are coming out of the COVID-19, we don't know what's ahead, right? But the one thing that's for sure is that we need to keep learning and unlearning what we know. One thing about the innovation ecosystem is that it's constantly adapting. There's always a new technology, there's new uh, business models being birthed, there's always something new being discovered. So one thing that we've done as ASIC is we've, we've actually come up with an ecosystem portal where we're able to now collect all these different type of research that have been uh, gathered by our members and then also looking at what are other development partners doing and also what the publications have come up with to be able to add that to the portal. The beautiful thing about this is that entrepreneurs can access this data so that even as they're building on their solution, they're not starting from scratch. They're picking up on the best practices. They're looking at what other countries have done. They're looking at what other partners have fostered, um, like the different type of partnerships, the different type of models, what has worked where, and they're able to actually localize it or adapt it for their own businesses. The third thing is that also we are pulling in academia. So even as ASEC, we have university hubs that are part of ASEC. This is actually great because now we are literally bringing industry within academia. And with that, we're able now to, and we already have ongoing discussions with a couple of universities where we actually have uh, PhD students, master students being attached to an innovation hub to research on specific topics that can actually be an input into the innovation model of the startup. And that is already ongoing. Uh, one of our members has already published a paper looking at the SME micro and small business policy within a specific county. And they did that in collaboration with a university. So when we start having this insight coming out, then it becomes easier even for us as ASEC to begin designing programs at a national level that can actually help to really address the core issues uh, that entrepreneurs are facing, which is capital, uh, access to capital, markets, and also talent. 
because talent also is becoming a huge need that they need to begin looking at. It's, it's great to have a business, but you also need a team to drive that innovation from ideation all the way to scale up. And so building a team is one thing that also we're trying to look at in how to support them. So I think those are just a couple of insights that I've shared, um, but yeah, you can let me know if you have any questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Marcy. Uh, to the participants, feel free to drop any questions or clarification uh, you have for ASEC. Uh, maybe just a quick one. Um, Marcy, we see a missing link uh, between the industry and uh, the academia and also the startups. What would you say is the gap that, okay, we have uh, innovations and uh, very good innovators in Kenya, but we don't see the products in the market? Yeah, so, so just touching on the last one, um, one thing that also we're trying to look at is do entrepreneurs really understand the basic fundamental principle, which is product market fit? So if you look at globally, uh, they did a study on the reasons why startups fail and they never really hit their third, uh, third year birthday is because they really lack, they do not provide a market need which ties in very closely with product market fit. So one thing that we've definitely tried to support our members on is developing the relevant toolkits that can actually help these startups prototype and fail quickly. Because now, if, for example, if the logo is placed on a different, uh, is placed at the back of a product, and you find the entrepreneur has spent so many months working on the technical parts of the product, and once it goes to market, it doesn't really speak about uh, what they're doing, there, right there, they fail because they lack the connection to the customer. The second thing is also the consumer market is changing. The trends are, are the trends are very different from what it was last year, and also different from when it was in COVID, and also before COVID, right? And so, this need for now pulling in academia in the terms of now becoming people. Uh, being able to actually do research on what does consumers want, what are the trends, and then being very specific on what type of product you want to launch. I've worked with other startups who have, you know, a portfolio of 10 products and they launch them all at the same time. It's very difficult for you to now see and understand which product is working and which one is not because of the confusion. So we also try and help them to um, get them to at least focus on one product where they can continuously prototype, even as they're launching into market, to really better understand their customer and what they need. And then also looking at the larger ecosystem and how, even for us, looking at how do we plug the startup into the corporate because we are also very we're very keen on creating a value chain of support right from ideation which are now the ideators to then becoming a startup to now becoming hopefully in the future a mature company so we're also looking at that value chain support and academia comes in very strongly in terms of now providing that data or that research that actually this information can be used by the startup to begin looking at their product understanding their customer and not only once but as a continual process and we call that iterating of your value proposition because that means also you're in time you're also being timely with the changing of the market needs again tying also back to policy but then also looking at the customer side as well thank you so much Masi. that was uh, very comprehensive uh before i bring in um luko viseke from auda nepad i'd want to hear quickly from uh, afri labs uh, we have a representation from afri labs on how they are contributing to the innovation uh, ecosystem in Africa. Uh, Mr. Fumilayo from AfriLabs, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Baran. Uh, my name is Fumilayo Kolkrik. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and I'm really excited to also hear Mercy speak. Um, like she said, we've worked on a couple of conferences uh, together to, you know, strengthen the ecosystem. Um, and so, um, very quickly um, about Afri Labs. Afri Labs is a network organization that supports over 400, currently 400. Um, innovation hubs across 52 African countries. Um, 
the network was built so that it, it would support uh, a community around uh, emerging innovation hubs across Africa, right? And as we all know, hubs are centers that support innovators and uh, developers uh, by providing either physical uh, co-working spaces, business support, legal support, or business development support to raise um, entrepreneurs and develop innovative solutions across Africa. Our vision at Afri Labs is strongly to ensure that we build a thriving innovation uh, economy right in Africa, and this is largely driven by our community. We have made sure that we've strengthened um, our network in the different African countries so that this is possible. And, you know, we support innovation hubs and we do this through supporting the innovation hubs in their communities to raise entrepreneurs that would essentially stimulate uh, economic and social development in Africa, right? There are several ways, like I said, we have uh, 400 members in 52 African countries. Um, there are several ways that we, we support the development of um, the technology innovation system. And some of the things that we do are focused largely around capacity building. A capacity building, uh, we run several capacity building programs. First is the AfriLabs Capacity Building Program, which is funded by AFD, the French Development Agency through the Digital Africa Seed Fund. Through the Capacity Building Program, we've um, trained over 5,000 uh, hub managers and staff. We've engaged over 2,000 stakeholders, which would include um, investors, entrepreneurs, startups, SMEs, MSMEs, academia, across the African continent. And what we basically do through this is to build the capacity of innovation hubs so that they in turn can support um, the startups and the startups, MSMEs and innovators through their community. We have also through this program, what we call the Afri Labs Academy, um, where innovation hub managers and founders can go on there and learn the basic skills that they will need to uh, support their startups to, to, to manage their innovation hubs, right? Um, to scale startups within their communities. Um, also, people who want to start innovation hubs, right, can go on there and take the courses and be certified in innovation hub man in innovation management. Through this program, we also have. We've also hosted workshops. We hosted um, one sometime in October in Zambia, where we focused on how to we focused on teaching innovation hubs how to design a successful venture building programs and how to also engage stakeholders within their community. We also do this through access of we also you know support the development of the ecosystem through access to funding. Right over the last two years, we've supported um, over ninety hubs with um, access to funding to be able to implement capacity building projects within their communities. And out of this um, projects that we've done, we've seen um, incubation programs come out. We've seen um, virtual. Um, we have we've seen uh, programs that are focused on um, acceleration. We've seen programs that are focused on building investor readiness uh, for startups across Africa. Right, we've seen different kinds of projects come out of this, and we also uh, published an impact report, which you can find on our website um, around the access to funding. We also have uh, worked with Brighter Bridges and other. Uh, credible research organizations to put together research and publication that would inform the ecosystem uh, to be able to make credible uh, for innovators and stakeholders to make credible decisions uh, to reference them and basically to ensure that we have data on the work that we do and the work that is done largely in the ecosystem. We partner a network and um, create collaboration right between um, um, ecosystem stakeholders, right? We have a lot of partners that we work with both in the, both in Africa and outside Africa and the diaspora, right? We work with GIZ, we work with the French Development Agency and some other really credible partners to ensure that the work we do in Africa is uh, projected. We also are strongly um, working on policy advocacy. Um, recently in Nigeria, the startup bill was passed, 
And uh, one of the things that we're looking to do is to ensure that the different policies that would ensure that innovation, right, is strengthened and the work that our innovators do in Africa is strengthened and to ensure that they have a credible and conducive environment, you know, to be able to uh, push their businesses and to ensure that, you know, they, they, they take off and they scale, you know, within Africa are some of the things that we do. Um, and just to speak a bit about uh, the green economy, right? Some of the work that we know that the, the role of um, innovators play, we, we, we largely uh, categorize it into the first thing, right? So for innovation homes, right? What are they supposed to do to ensure, you know, that the green economy or green um, innovators in the, in the African ecosystem are supported, right? The first is, right, we need to focus, so they need to focus on creating innovation, innovative solutions, right? How do we do this? We look through uh, research, so what's going on currently in the continent? How do we as innovation hubs be able to support the innovators in our community to come up with creative ideas? What are the things that we need to put in place, right, in our economy, in our, what kind of, um, what kind of environments, Right, do we need to create in the hubs to ensure that the innovators, first of all, are supported? Right, do we need to create um, specialized hubs? There are some hubs that are focused on a specific sector, right? So that's the first thing. The second is that we are working to build specialized curriculums for innovators in the green sector. We recently um, partnered with, worked with the GCA, the Global Center on, Adapt on uh, Climate Adaptation, right, to run a Youth Adapt Challenge, right, and one of the things that is coming out of that project is a specialized curriculum that will be focused on climate adaptation and the green economy, right. The third thing is that to fund innovators with ideas and innovative solutions within the, you know, the green economy, right. So we've identified these guys, we built a curriculum that they can work on, now, how do they implement the curriculum, right? So we, that's where the funding then comes in. And, you know, partner with organizations that are then focused on promoting this innovation. One of the programs that we're also running the world is funded by the World Food Program, where we've gone to uh, different cities, Tanzania, Rwanda. I was in Rwanda last month, you know, to view and see some of the innovators and some of the innovations you know that are focused on green economy there and how they are thriving right and the last thing is to align and support you know policy advocacy for these innovations across Africa so if we do all this we focus on you know creating the hubs that will, that will support innovators we ensure that we have curriculums we fund them right partner with organizations that would help their investment grow you know and their work grow but if there is no baseline right if the environment in Africa or the policy environment in Africa is not conducive for these innovations to scale and to grow then you know um the the work that we do won't wouldn't really come out effective right so one of the things and the, the final thing is to then create an environment in Africa right to ensure that you know these innovators are properly supported the policies that are that emanates are focused on their growth, right? And to ensure, you know, that they, they largely succeed in Africa. So these are some of the things that we do. And these are some of the things that we're really working with our hubs to do. Um, and we hope that with all this, we would ensure um, that the, the economy grows largely. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, you're doing a very amazing job uh, in terms of strengthening innovation hubs in Africa. Uh, we have a question from uh, Leah. Uh, what are the policy incentives that are currently being implemented to promote poor innovations in Kenya? Well, I think uh, this would largely be to Mercy. I don't know, because I know that Mercy, that the ASEC team is doing a lot of work um, on innovations in Kenya, especially around policy. Masi, do you want to come in? Mm. 
Okay, so so yeah. just maybe before Mercy, or while we wait for Mercy to come up, I know that uh, she spoke. She had spoken um, largely about when the the moving the startup bill to the startup act. So I know that that's one thing you know that in terms of policy right that the Kenyan government is or that ASEC is really working on you know to ensure that it is whatever um, innovations or whatever policies being put in place right is is largely focused on poor innovations right but I'm I can't speak into the detail basically for Kenya so that's why in relationship thank you so much um in terms of uh, maybe the policy, I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Lukovi Seke from Auda Nepad. I know recently we had the AU EU innovation strategy. Uh, maybe he will touch on uh, the time in terms of uh, the policy in incentives across Africa that they have in terms of innovation and supporting startups. Uh, so maybe quickly, um, Mr. Lukovi Seke, if you can give us some insights from the AU. EU innovation uh, strategy, and also maybe a quick update from uh, the AU, the Africa Innovation Outlook. Uh, you're Hello. muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. So I, I need to give you an update, first of all, on the on the uh, AU EU innovation agenda, the way we are seeing our next uh, uh, engagement with Europe before coming back to the measurement we have on the continent, or I can do the opposite if you don't mind. So uh, probably I will take you through the same slide I presented uh, during the uh, science forum as we are in Cape Town for you to understand the issue of incentive when it came to our position as a UDA NEPAD. So let me start with the first uh, slide. Sorry for really uh, bombarding you with uh, more uh, presentation, but uh, I hope it, everything will be okay. So I'll start with the first one. Okay, so uh, this indeed is giving us an update. It, it applies also for this meeting. Uh, we spoke about the issue of measurement. Uh, uh, related to science, technology, and innovation, as well as uh, sustainable development goal. As you understand, that what is happening nowadays is that uh, we are the African Union. We have 55 member states, but we are also part of the United Nations system, except for North Korea. So, uh, when you check the sustainable development goal target uh, number nine, uh, sustainable development goal nine, uh, it, it focuses more on uh, infrastructure, uh, innovation, and uh, industrialization. And we believe in Africa, we are industrialized, but we need to accelerate our level of industrialization. Because if we can say that we cannot industrialize, so then we have to ask ourselves, what is happening with our manufacturing sector? We have a manufacturing sector booming in various countries, Coco, when we go to uh, uh, to, 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 to Ghana because they're making chocolate and we have South Africa and we also have Nigeria. And those are just uh, example without uh, excluding Kenya indeed. So uh, we have a target number 9.5, where it is requested to increase the number of, uh, of researchers uh, uh, per 100,000 inhabitants and also to increase the level of uh, investment in R&D. So what I need to uh, emphasize here is that uh, on the continent, the, the minister realized that most of our policy were outdated and they were not designed based on, on, on evidences. And then because we reached the era of, uh, of uh, African Union, as you understand, we are no longer the Af organization of African unity. During that era, we were fighting with those who colonized us because we could not really talk using the same language. Until uh, South Africa has been freed, uh, then at least we changed now. We became the African Union and the, the, dropping the, 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 the previous uh, status of being the Organization of African Unity, where we should fight for our independence. And because we came up with a new instrument and it was obvious for us to come up also with another uh, platform or another project or another initiative or another program 
another setup to facilitate collaboration and partnership between Africa and Europe. That was the NEPAD uh, uh, program, and uh, we have five uh, founder, father of uh, of. Uh, of, of uh, NEPAD, and today, as we speak, is uh, one of the development agencies we have uh, as part of the African Union. And when we check the production function, I know some of you might be economists, not uh, those who are not uh, apology for sharing this uh, uh, slide with you. Just we understand that uh, for us to survive, we need to consume, and sometimes we can consume without having an income. Uh, there is a net mass consumption. So it and by, by the time we have also an income, then we can uh, take a portion of the, our consumption from that income, and the remaining can be saved. But we also believe that for us to produce, we need a uh, uh, and workers, we need also uh, infrastructure, and we also need land if we are in agriculture. So it's why we are putting the L for labor, and especially for worker, K for capital, and N for land. But when we come up with uh, the production function, and uh, you will see that uh, we need physical capital, we need labor, but uh, we cannot just have uh, people who are not educated because we understand also uh, uh, the level of education is not that people refuse to go to school. It might be related to the income. People could not afford. And uh, some of us who had an opportunity to go to university is just a miracle because uh, not all of the family around the world can afford to go to the university. And we have very brilliant people. Is why now we have the, the vocational training component where at least someone can have his own capability and do something very well, even though the person doesn't have a degree. And when we check now here, you will understand to fit in the current knowledge base and innovation led economy, we need to make sure that we empower our people with knowledge. So uh, knowledge is now guiding everything we are doing nowadays. If you innovate to do something new or you put on the market or to be used, uh, uh, you need now to make sure that you put a, a, a level of knowledge inside. Is why for some of our firm to, to be resilient to the market, at least we need to, to advise them to have some uh, R&D department. And uh, uh, we have a three type of production system uh, function. And uh, let us just use the, 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 the overall uh, 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 CAS uh, 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 production function. When you check this model, you, you realize that we have the capital, we have labor. And there is a parameter that we're considering uh, as neutral. That was technology. But nowadays, we believe that technology is no longer neutral, is even going beyond from being a parameter to be a variable if we have to define our growth. So uh, uh, that's the reason why you see that uh, in the ecosystem, uh, when we have our national system of innovation, all the stakeholders consume and all the stakeholders should play a very key role. And for us to really uh, fit properly in our knowledge-based innovation-led economy, we need to focus on research, not only firms, even tertiary institutions, they are obliged now to do more research, not only for promotion, but that research can also lead us to innovation. We understand that we cannot preach the linear model, assuming that if we put money into research, automatically we are going to innovate. No, but there is a possibility also to innovate without doing R&D. But uh, in the current knowledge-based economy, it's very difficult for firms to continue innovating without doing a bit of research. So, uh, uh, and that, that applies also to the, the, the fourth industrial revolution. As I was saying, Africa is industrialized, but we need to accelerate our industrialization because industrialization starts since 18, uh, 1744. So if we say that Africa is not industrialized, then we are just fooling ourselves. So we cannot say uh, such a lie. So uh, um, then we, we are also fitting in the fourth industrial revolution. So you see everything we have in the fourth industrial revolution with the youngsters, the millennials using devices sometimes of some of the old people cannot even manipulate the phone as we, uh, 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 as the youngster can do. And we see the cloud computing, the internet, internet of things. We, are, we have the drone, the 3D printing, all those aspects require that uh, even when you go to the website of some of the American uh, uh, job uh, offers, you will see that everything is data science and so forth. So it means that we need really to make sure that we focus more on R&D. We invest in R&D is very important for us to make sure that we compete in the current age, especially uh, opening our border as far as uh, African free trade continental area is concerned. 
So if we have to close the border saying that we don't need commodity from Tanzania, uh, agricultural commodity from Tanzania or from another country near Kenya, then we are going to end up to the, the trade court where we are saying that we are violating the, the rule in terms of trade. So uh, it requires now, we need to have some of our product to be embedded with some knowledge and R&D aspect. So you see uh, through the African STI indicator program, the intention was first of all to help African Union member states to understand the concept, the jargon of uh, uh, what, uh, what uh, STI stands for. And we have co-indicators because STI is huge. We understand that science and technology cover mainly tertiary uh, uh, education and training, uh, cover R&D and cover also services related to science and technology. And and also we have innovation where we have, we have more novelty. Anything related to novelty is related to innovation or improvement. Going to the market or being used, it could be a product, it could be a, a production process, it could be a, a, a method how to organize yourself as an entity to improve for more perform for better performance and also how to um, uh, uh, do your commercialization process. And because of that, we managed to start getting uh, some information from countries, especially indicators. Uh, 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 and, and those indicators are mainly uh, uh, R&D and innovation data. The way they package those indicators, they become internationally comparable and they are different to uh, data. So now we have a, a combination of uh, a set of data. We have indicators on that. So, and uh, when we have those indicators, we are seeing that we are able now to inform the continent on the status of uh, R&D spending. And also, we can also uh, participate in some of the international gathering. And uh, what is happening on the continent is that uh, we can never do anything without getting clearance from uh, a senior official at the country level, from a director general to, to, to ministers and head of state. And uh, as you could see in, uh, from this uh, slide, you see the, the framework that we have on the continent guiding everything we have to implement in terms of science, technology, and innovation. And uh, even in terms of education, we have the continental education strategy for Africa. And uh, also when it's come to industrialization, we have uh, a strategy to accelerate our industrialization. And in all those three uh, framework we have on the continent, the play is always to push member states to invest at least 1% of GDP into research. And also when it comes to the uh, global framework that we call Agenda uh, 2020, 2030, especially Sustainable Development Goal, so still as I raised it before, we have nine point, uh, nine, 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 uh, target 9.5. So, and, uh, and uh, beyond that, you will see that uh, we are also uh, uh, working with the European Union to see how uh, both the African Union, where we have 55 member states, and, uh, and uh, the European Union, where they have only have 26 member countries, could collaborate, especially to go beyond R&D and to make sure that uh, we, 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 we leverage on the level of uh, innovation. And we don't need countries in Africa or institution in Africa to, to not be prepared. And that's the reason why, uh, because ministers decided that both ministers of uh, those from the African Union and the European Union, when they met in 2020, they decided that it's important for us to come up with the AU EU innovation agenda. Are we ready? So as we are part of this meeting, we have our own responses, but we have the responsibility as EU bodies to work with all the stakeholders to make sure that African countries and the stakeholders are not behind. And when we check even the level of our commitment in R&D, is why we need that incentive. Because what is happening in some of the countries, uh, what, what should be spent in terms of R&D is not only what firms are spending. And we also understand the government also is spending money in R&D. So when we check now the trend globally, you will see that African member states are below the 1%. That was something we were singing about since 1980. It was a plea from member states. But we're not making it. And we have various reasons because we need to have a proper national policy on science, technology, and innovation for us to make sure that we have those targets. And we have to track the targets. And all the stakeholders in the national system 
of innovation should really be involved to support this agenda. And what is happening in South Africa, after realizing that uh, the only way to push the business sector to support more R&D, it was to secure an environment where incentive is given to firms, especially, let's say, if Dr. Johannes or, 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 or Dr. Ridley, they have firms and they spend, let's say, uh, 200 uh, 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 local currency units in, in R&D. And what, when, if they have to, let's say, pay a, a tax of 1,000, then they will tell them to say, uh, okay, take 150% of what you spent in R&D, deduct it from your tax. They call it tax incentive. So, so the government is not giving you money, uh, but because the government doesn't have money, the, the, the only money the government has is tax. Now they will tell you, Okay, from what you owe us, deduct 150% of what you spent in R&D, then give us the difference. That's the only way uh, for, 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 for our, our countries to support uh, uh, entity, especially firms, when it's come to really commit themselves into R&D, because R&D is a risk. You can spend in R&D without getting any reward and without discovering. So we should not really force some of the entity in our countries when they receive money from the government, to discover the following year, because we have to be patient. We need to secure money in a way that the researcher can be there permanently without being bothered, because we need to give him enough time for him to discover. It's why when we do the innovation survey, you see that the, 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 the period we are giving to, to firms is three years, at least the, covering, the, the, the coverage we have there. And we have a, 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 an update, an illustration of for how many countries have been covered, the green one we had, training with them. The yellow one, uh, they attended the regional training workshop and South Africa is well advanced because they, need, they don't need even to be trained because they are mature in their system. But it's showing that we need really to start uh, convincing uh, 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 STI uh, 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 segment within parliament in most of the countries for them really to make sure that uh, anytime they receive a request from various ministry coming uh, during the adoption of the budget national budget in the parliament they have to support it because if we cannot uh, invest more in r d in the current knowledge-based economy and innovation-led economy then we have to really start only uh, importing labor skilled labor we have to uh, allow chinese to come in our country to build our facilities because we are neglecting something very important and that we cannot uh, uh, excuse ourselves and uh, no one will forgive us global competition is very high and everything is very aggressive outside there. So the only way for us to survive is to invest in R&D. And when you check this illustration, based on data we see from countries, because we release what we call the AU flagship deliverable, known as the African Innovation Outlook, giving us an update on the level of investment on R&D. You will see that when we check the number of people who are involved as a researcher, because a huge portion of a, a salary is going to, to R&D, especially, or, or the budget going to R&D, a, a big share is, is covering personnel. And when we check here, you see just the level of commitment in, in field of R&D, because we have six field of R&D, including the cross-cutting one, making it seven. When we check, especially, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say take one of the country in East, Eastern African region. We, we can take Rwanda, we can take also Tanzania, and we can also take DRC that joined uh, recently ESC, and even Burundi, you see uh, the commitment in natural sciences. But when we come to Southern Africa, you see that Botswana, where uh, they covered four sectors of R&D, business sector, government, higher education, and private non for profit you will see that almost 40% of for those who are researchers, they are in the field of uh, natural sciences. And when you check those who are in social sciences, very little. And when we check the country that uh, has a huge share in terms of uh, number of researchers in engineering, you will see that uh, Lesotho is part of it, even though they only cover two sectors, is a J, well, that uh, stands for government, and H for higher education. So, and we also have Seychelles, where they cover four, four sectors. We can see that uh, uh, engineering and technology is covering something around uh, 35%. So, uh, you see, and uh, you can just Google the African Innovation Outlook, uh, 2010, 2014, or 2019, you can also get some of those information. And we have most of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the senior experts involved in the field of SEA measurement and policy who are part of what we are doing. And we, uh, we use the, the, the OECD guideline 
we got, because we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, especially when you check the infrastructure manual. It has been there for 50 years and to track the level of investment in R&D. And we try also to do it on the continent. Even though we, have, we also have some reality on the continent, we have to be uh, aware of that. We also have the guideline that uh, allow us to capture the level of commitment in, uh, in innovation. So, and you find everything in those documents. So what we are trying to do is to create a community of practice, like we are part of this meeting, uh, part of the ARI network, to make sure that uh, they discuss field, this, this case community that we are uh, uh, focusing on STI, uh, that we, 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 we started really engaging on issue that should help our member states to make use of uh, science, technology, and innovation, especially research and innovation, to, to really change uh, and transform our, our communities. And uh, uh, we, we, we also, uh, we are also trying to make sure that some of the official on the continent attend some of the session on the global north, global south in Sweden for the month. And you could see uh, 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 last year we had uh, two Kenyan. This year I think we have one or two Kenyan again who are going to go uh, uh, for in next year. Yeah, it, but they're going next year to, to Sweden. And in May uh, this year, some uh, two from Kenya went there from ACT and uh, from the ministry. And we are also piloting uh, uh, using the same approach to make sure that uh, uh, we, 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 we involve more stakeholders in the measurement process. We are focusing now on the integrated data uh, uh, aspect where we believe the, the firm are not responding when it comes to, to collect data from them. For us to create an environment for more incentive, they feel that you are spying on them. If they give you their financial information, so then you are going to report to the revenue service. So if we cannot really get those information, how may we help firms? Is why now we are realizing it's important for us to triangulate various databases because we can focus on socioeconomic survey to get information from firms and to make sure that we understand the challenges they are going through. Why are they spending less in R and D? All those aspects are very important. So, uh, and the challenge that we are having on the continent is that the, the one percent target that we say all the stakeholders involved in R&D performance at the country level should reach, that is only a minimum. We never reach that. And Kenya is the only country when we, we, we re released the first African Innovation Outlook, decided that they are going, you are going to take your, your, your target to 2%. Uh, 2% of your GDP should be invested in R&D. That is, that is one thing, that is only a target. But we need to monitor that target. We need to track it. It means that each year we have to do what we do. We call the R&D survey. And we are happy that the RE network secure the, the Kenyan uh, innovation outlook. So that is giving a picture of uh, how it's important for uh, uh, at least uh, 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 the, our country to be involved in the process. Not only Kenya, but we are seeing more, than, more, more countries uh, uh, when it comes to it. So we need now African countries to own the process. When uh, the, the, the facilitator is asking me uh, to, to, to come up, to cover the, 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 the aspect of how we are seeing to incentivize, incentivize uh, some of our constituency when it comes to R&D. So we need really firms to, to understand the importance of uh, having R&D units. If they cannot have R&D units, then let firms collaborate with universities as is happening in the US, where we find some of the universities, they have budget beyond our government budget in some of African countries. When you check Harvard University, Massachusetts, all those institutes, because the system, the national innovation system is well synchronized in a way that we believe you cannot find solution alone. So when you have a river which is, that is polluted and you have a firm aside, you need to call the university to help you because that river will affect the community and then all this hospital will be full again so it so everything is really synchronized and we really need african countries to make sure that we own we own our data and it's very important and uh, they, they, they they to conclude i was trying to make sure that uh, i share with you the this aspect of us uh, uh, being involved in this agenda for me to conclude with this uh, last uh, uh, slide, if you don't mind. Hello, Mr. Che, can I proceed? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lukovi. Uh, that was very, very comprehensive. Can I have two or three minutes again to conclude uh, with the overview of the AU, EU innovation agenda? Okay, two minutes. 
Thank you. So, uh, uh, as I was saying in my previous presentation, that uh, uh, our official, a minister in charge of uh, science, technology, and innovation, and those uh, and their peers in Europe agreed that we should come up with uh, an innovation agenda. And the focus uh, is mainly on uh, on four uh, segments: uh, public health, green transition, innovation, and technology capacity for science. And uh, you you can understand the 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 the, 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 the consequence of COVID. COVID didn't look at our faces, our the color of our skin, all of us, we suffer from the same, uh, uh, we suffer the same way. But because the prediction was too high in terms of African will be passing away, I think a miracle happened. We didn't pass away as people were expecting that we to die. But we believe that there is a possibility now for us to start engaging without looking on uh, our, at our races that uh, Europe and uh, uh, Africa, especially both Union, can focus on uh, uh, the, the, the capability we have, you know, the institutional capability we have to make sure that uh, we, 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 we improve the awareness of our people to health, uh, uh, green transition, innovation and technology and capacity. So, and what is happening, as I was saying, there is nothing coming just by chance for us to implement as both union. We need to focus on existing frameworks, the international one, the the, the sustainable development goal, the African one, uh, even the one focusing on the STI and the European one. Okay, so and then for us to come up with the draft uh, 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 AU EU innovation agenda, we focus on previous research and innovation activities and uh, the result of uh, of lesson learned of uh, uh, EU EU uh, innovation partnership project and opinion from uh, uh, the AU EU advisory group. Also, discussion taking place through uh, the, the 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 ministerial setup on uh, research and innovation uh, without ignoring some of the mapping assignment on the EU-AU research and innovation partnership on food and nutrition security. As you know, this year, it has been decided that we call it the, the year of uh, food security at the African Union level. So when you, you, now you check the level of collaboration, when we'll be implementing this uh, agenda that we believe ministers in charge of STI and head of state from next year, quarter four or quarter three, they will just give blessing to, to this frame, to this uh, uh, collaborative agenda for us to really work together. And all the stakeholders should be involved, even the civil society. As we're saying, public health, green transition, innovation technology capacity for science are key. And uh, when the need and the gap analysis has been done, so uh, the, the area that has been flagged are innovation ecosystem, innovation management, knowledge exchange, including technology transfer, access to even a budget finance and also human capability. So when we check now the issue of management of innovation, it's impossible to manage innovation if we cannot measure innovation. So, and uh, to conclude, uh, we say that for us to make uh, a proper impact in uh, implementing the AU EU innovation agenda, we need to flag, to, to, to frame it in, 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 in actions. We have the short-term action, we have the mid-term action, and we have the long-term actions. So as I was saying, we have four clusters, public health, green transition, innovation and technology and capacity for science. But we should not forget that we can find issues that are cross-cutting. That is why you see under short-term, a cross-cutting layer that we are having there, how we have to force the participation of financing partner, banks should be involved to support and also to have network for business uh, where we have a government, our education sector. So all the four sectors that perform R&D, they have to really team up together. So when we go to public health, you understand the importance of uh, really us focusing on uh, health research and innovation. Output is very critical at the age where we have to use uh, robotic artificial intelligence to manage more information, more data, so to to reach the level of uh, of uh, precision medicine. And when it comes to green transition, you will see that uh, there is a need to focus on renewable energy and uh, and also to support uh, 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 to focus on innovative climate services, innovation technology. We need to make sure that uh, 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 small, medium, and uh, small and medium enterprises from both union collaborate. And we don't need a, 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 dis a disequilibrium. We need a win-win situation. We don't need a, a, a firm in Kenya. By the time they enter, it enter into collaboration with the EU uh, uh, firm that uh, it, 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 the collaboration is not balanced. So it should be a win-win situation. And in terms of capacity, we need to make sure that uh, we empower our government, especially higher education uh, institution and, and government institution when we collaborate 
with uh, with Europe, especially when it comes to knowledge transfer and also uh, mobility is also crucial for us and to understand. And uh, medium, you will see we have the cross cutting where we need to upskill our citizen. It's very important because uh, uh, nowadays what is happening when we had internet, people were not uh, resistant to use the email because they, they, we were used to PO box. So and nowadays. Uh, you, you don't need to wait for a month to receive your letter, even application, you just send an email and uh, after 10 minutes, you have a feedback from uh, 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 Egypt when you send it from Kenya, from America or from Europe. So that is to show you how science is changing everything. And uh, we, we have the public health, everything is, is there. You can see tech transfer and the green transition. We need to focus on the digital application and the green technology, even to sense, to do the sensing of our, our soul. We can use remote sensing, satellite, all those aspects, uh, very crucial. And we need to promote the joint masters and doctoral degrees. So all those are very important, okay? So and the, the long-term one is just to make sure that uh, everything we're doing in uh, short and mid-term, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have some impact, okay? Uh, when it comes to uh, precision agriculture, precision yeah. medicine, and uh, to make sure that uh, we, we, we really bridge the R&D and innovation uh, gap between uh, both union. And we have to modernize also our universities. You know, some of the institution, uh, uh, some of the countries, when you are working, you cannot even have a possi the possibility to, to do your study. You have to go physically at the university or at the tertiary institution. Well, in other countries, you can just remain in your office after hours to do your study online. So those are the aspects that we have to consider to empower also our people. So uh, really, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, concluding here, I really thank you for, 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 for really following and we also have a knowledge product. You can Google that, the Join AU EU Innovation Agenda, when Sun Technology and Innovation stand for sustainable tangible impact. So thank you indeed and uh, uh, apology for for really bombarding you with more slides. And it was important for us to give you uh, an understanding of how we can really make sure that uh, uh, research is supported and the firm uh, are also given some incentive when it's come to tax rebate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Lukovi. That was a very passionate presentation. Uh, we will not uh, end the side event without getting a, a case study presentation on the amazing innovation and startups uh, we are having in Africa. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Eddie Gitonga for like three minutes uh, to kind of showcase the kind of innovation they have and uh, the impact they have in the community. As we close with the overview of the Kenya Innovation Outlook that uh, uh, Arin, uh, in collaboration with the Kenya National Innovation Agency, did and is being launched during the Kenya Innovation Week today and tomorrow. So, Mr. Eddie Gitonga, uh, you have three minutes to do your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, and thank you for uh, this opportunity and also the previous speakers that have presented. I've also really learned a lot. Apparently, uh, we're also with Marcy at the Kenya Innovation Week. I apparently have a pitch in one hour, 30 minutes, uh, exactly, uh, but I had to make uh, time for this because it's really important on the, you know, on the innovations that, uh, you know, are disruptive. Now that we, we post COVID and, you know, we have had so many innovations that have, uh, you know, have come up to, you know, to really uh, disrupt the market. So I'll be sharing my screen to showcase uh, whatever I'll be uh, presenting today. So let me share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, sorry for the background noise. So I don't know whether you can see my screen right now. Not yet. Okay. Um, What about what about right now? Not yet. Okay, let me. Sorry. Um. Okay. So let me share my screen. Um. Start now. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, maybe Eddie, you can just uh, tell us briefly what you do and uh, the impact.
Unfortunately, we can't hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eddie. Uh, we'll uh, finalize uh, the side event uh, with uh, insights from the Kenya Innovation Outlook. So I'd uh, like to bring in uh, Tom Randa to just briefly highlight some of the insights uh, and key findings from the Kenya Innovation Outlook. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bren. Hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah I, I'll, I'll be a bit brief. Um, there's this um, um, Kenya Innovation Outlook uh, a work that uh, the ARI Network, uh, in collaboration with the, the Kenya, Kenya Innovation Agency, uh, worked on early in the year uh, with the support of FCDO, and it's being uh, uh, launched um this week in the kenya innovation week so um in this particular work and for that reason i won't uh, maybe uh, give all the details most of the details until the launch is done so um it's good um, that the global uh, bodies the eu the au um are, are, are really sharing innovation but when we come back at the local level in nationally and even um, in the sub-national level, like for example in Kenya, um, our innovation system um, uh, is still uh, developing and it's um, a kind of young. So uh, this particular uh, work or study, uh, we wanted to uh, kind of understand um, the ecosystem of uh, innovation at a national scale. And therefore the, re the report or the innovation outlook is structured uh, with a background with some of the details uh, shown uh, concepts and de definitions because you have to understand um, the context in which we are defining innovation in kenya um, and other innovation systems uh, as a nation uh, building that consensus then there's a methodology on how the work was done uh, then the outlook itself um, where we've structured it in terms of domains, the key domains uh, we are looking at, their seats. Then in each domain, there are subdomains. Um, uh, then the frontier domains that came out uh, and some recommendations. Then we also developed a scoreboard where the indicators in each of these domains and subdomains are mapped. Uh, then we are giving some conclusion and next steps because it's not conclusive. Um, the reason why this study uh, was um, uh, critical for Kenya um, is to provide an integrated framework for effective governance of innovation activities in Kenya. And therefore, it provides um, a surveillance tool uh, for identifying niches for strategic investments and economic growth. Um, the areas of innovations are wide, and therefore, investors uh, are looking for niches where they can strategically invest and even the government is looking for strategic areas to spur economic growth and therefore understanding the entire innovation uh, ecosystem in kenya was critical um, and i think that touches on the objective so the main goal was to develop a comprehensive overview of the kenya innovation uh, landscape and its evolution in the past 10 uh, 10 years and um, uh, the method or the process uh, is detailed here, but um, the main bit of uh, this work is on the framework which was used. And therefore, um, uh, we looked at the inputs uh, or the innovation platforms. Innovation doesn't just happen um, uh, uh, from nowhere. Whether it's formal or informal, it's anchored on some form of knowledge. And therefore, we looked at the knowledge and uh, knowledge production and innovation uh, knowledge or ideas sources. And therefore, we classify them as academic or non-academic. Uh, and in this, we are also keen on looking at the outputs. 
Uh, we also um, explored the piloting platforms, uh, which are um, mostly used for scaling and commercialization. Uh, we call them the uh, scaling uh, platforms, uh, but also we looked at the uptake after the scaling, uh, after the scaling and commercialization or incubation of the innovation. They have taken in another platform. And we also explored and mapped uh, all these, but we were also aware of uh, other inputs um, uh, uh, such as investments and incentives. And we also explored the impediments um, that could um, influence or affect um, the innovation value chain, the progress of innovation from an idea to a final product. So this is the framework which uh, the outlook was anchored on. And um, just a glimpse of um, the key domains, uh, we have the national and global economic legis uh, legislative context because all innovations must be operating within a legal framework. Then we have the innovation value chains, uh, inputs and investments, incentives, impediments and impacts. Um, and in the impacts, we also explored some case studies uh, which are uh, showcased. So a total uh, of you, 172. Right. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, this uh, report, the Kenya Innovation Outlook report, was launched yesterday by the President of Kenya. Uh, we'll be sharing the link uh, to the participants so you can go through it. Uh, thank you so much for those who have joined to participate in this side event. And now I'm going to close the link. Uh, may God bless you all, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Good job.